Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to our first uh, Q&A session. You'll see we have uh, three lovely people here. Zavier, you want to come to the frame? Uh, <laughs> so uh, my name is Charlie. I'm the instructor on the uh, English run of the QCSE. My name uh, is Leila. Bonjour à tous. Je suis un instructeur sur la partie en français du cours. And uh, this is our first live Q&A where you guys will first uh, hear a bit about uh, the experience of an entrepreneur going through uh, the journey that you're going through in this program. Uh, and then you'll get some time at the end to ask some questions. So allow about 10 to 15 minutes for the talk. And then you can put in your questions in the chat. And uh, Leila and I will field them and Xavier will be able to answer them for you. Oui, alors ce que, euh, on va avoir une introduction avec euh, Xavier qui est là avec nous aujourd'hui. Donc ça va être une introduction de 10 à 15 minutes. Et suite à ça, on va pouvoir répondre à toutes vos questions. Euh, donc euh, il faut vraiment euh, compter comme 10 à 15 minutes avant de pouvoir poser vos questions. Et ce sera un plaisir pour nous de pouvoir y répondre. All right. Okay. So with that, uh, let Xavier take it on. You can introduce yourself and uh, get started. Bonjour tout le monde. J'ai euh, été invité pour vous, pour vous présenter euh, mon expérience par rapport à un parcours entrepreneur. So I've been invited to, uh, to speak to you this morning about my experience uh, as an entrepreneur. And, and most, I think importantly from what they told me, is my experience as someone who came from a research environment, a research lab, an engineer. Um, that was working in a very scientific environment um, and then eventually converted to entrepreneurship. Um, and, and that's, um, that's been full. It's been fascinating. It's been a great, you know, this started for me 30 years ago. Donc, ça a été, uh, ça a été extrêmement intéressant. Ça a été fascinant. Ça m'a ça amené uh, uh, dans des, des zones, dans des endroits que j'aurais jamais imaginé. À la fois sur la, la planète, j'ai voyagé autour du monde plusieurs fois. Uh, j'ai rencontré des gens extraordinaires, que ce soit des ingénieurs, des hommes d'affaires, um, des familles, uh, des, des membres de mon équipe, des, des gens dans l'usine. Um, ça a été un parcours vraiment extraordinaire. Um, et ils m'ont demandé de le partager avec vous, donc je, je vais essayer. Je ne pense pas que je vais parler pendant 15 minutes, donc je vais contredire uh, dès le début, mais, uh, mais, mais ça vous donnera plus de temps de questions. Donc, donc première chose, d'où je viens um, il était dans les débuts des années 80, donc il y a maintenant très longtemps pour la plupart d'entre vous. Um, si vous étiez même probablement pas né pour la plupart d'entre vous, au début des années 80, j'étais à Concordia, uh, dans un des sous-sols du, uh, du hall building. So I was in the basement of the hall building. And uh, I was very much um, excited about the new microprocessors. You know? um, I was coding on a, on a Motorola 6809, which is the same platform than... Then Steve Wozniak launched their first um, their first uh, their first product with. So it gives you an idea how far back we were doing robots. We were doing flight simulators using microprocessors. We had a cool multidisciplinary environment of, of uh, mechanical guys, software guys, hardware guys, um, a, a great inventors. I remember uh, Nick Kruglikoff, um, Professor Svoboda, Murdoch McKinnon. Um, Fernando Petrosiello, Tom Allen, um, Joe Frazio. I could go on to the to the number of people that were fascinating, really smart people. And um, and then one day we said, let's become entrepreneurs. And our reasoning for becoming entrepreneurs is because we didn't want to have real jobs. So the idea was that we were so knowledgeable and so smart, we were going to go to uh, industry, create a company, and have an easy life. Doesn't that sound good? Don't have to report to anyone. Um, decide what we do, decide which business we do, um, decide what we work on, we like the projects, we don't like the projects. So far, sounds good. Well, it's not exactly how it worked. Um, we ended up becoming, um, had to learn a lot. But before I get to the learn a lot, it was really cool to leave as a team. When we left the lab, a lot of teams got formed. And, uh, and I think that as, um, as a researcher, as a scientist, as an engineer that becomes an entrepreneur, one of the first things that you need to become aware of is that this is a team story. You do not have all the skills that are needed to do what needs to be done. So it doesn't matter the form by which you create the team, could be multiple shareholders in the same company, could be great people that you've paid really well that work for you, Part of the team is going to be your mentors, uh, your board members, your investors, 
team can have a very wide definition, but your first preoccupation and your first thought should be, how do I build that team? Um, how do I bring those people around me that are going to both have that high level of technical expertise I need, be it in computing, in software, in artificial intelligence, in, in genomics, whatever it is that you need, and how am I going to combine that with the people, the deep skills in business? You know, a lot of people think, I remember they used to make the joke all the time in the team, ah, Xavier, the sales guys, Martini and Olives, um, because that was the the image that engineers at the time had of business people, they're the guys that throw the big parties and go for dinner and, and have fancy expense accounts, right? Uh, what, what they didn't realize and what I had to share with them is that sales is actually a method. Business is a method. There's a lot of tools. Um, things can be planned. Things have to be thought out. Um, but not everyone can become a master at all technologies. Neither can everyone become a master at both engineering technology, science, and, and the different aspects of business. Um, so that's my, this morning, probably the most important message that I could think of uh, for anyone who wants to go down this entrepreneurial journey. And I can tell you it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a lot of fun because you meet great people. You do have a lot of freedom. But I must say that it takes dedication. Dedication in two ways. One, it's a lot of time. Uh, in due time, it, it'll wrap you up. You'll become so passionate and addicted to it that it's a bit like an addiction. Um, it, it's so much fun that, that you can't do without it. Um, you'll be so connected with your team that, that it's, it'll feel like you're, you're, um, you must be with them. Um, and so, so yeah, you, you need the team and you need perseverance um, and, and you need methods and tools. So uh, I'll give you an example of a, of a very decisive moment. Um, at one point, we, um, we were so ahead of technology, and this is going to sound really um, almost unconceivable from you guys in your generation. Um, Tom and Fernando had created a, the equivalent of what I would call today an industrial iPad. So think about in the early 80s, um, you created uh, a really cool iPad. And uh, in hindsight, you think, wow, they must have sold a zillion of these products. Well, we didn't. And, uh, and the reason why we didn't is because we were way too early. So... I'm ready to gamble that most of you guys that are on this journey have knowledge about sciences, technology, engineering that is way ahead of the market. Um, and to win this, this um, what I'm going to call this, this war, which is the, the, the battlefield of entrepreneurship, um, you definitely need to pick the customers and the market that's ready. So, for example, you could be thinking, well, who needs an iPad? In those days, we thought that people at Via Rail and on train tracks needed those things to work with train and wagons and maintenance and all that stuff. Um, maybe we should have done like uh, Steve Jobs and thought, well, maybe those tools belong in the kitchen with uh, people that are looking for cooking recipes, right? And uh, we could have figured out a market that was much more ready. We didn't. Turned out that that product, by the way, never made it to market with us. We had other products that did, flight simulators and, and then sludge recycling machines and, and a bunch of other products. Um, we had a lot of fun investing in, um, based always on the technology, but the key was finding the right clients at the right time. So um, the luck that you have in this program and I think in today, compared to 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago when, when District 3 was created, is that the world is making a whole bunch of tools available and ready for you to use. Um, this program is an example. A space like District 3 is, when we started District 3 five years ago, we were one of a, less than a handful in Montreal. Um, now there's many places that once you finish this program can host you in all sorts of different sectors, 
um, with all sorts of different specialties and with tools that are available. The cloud is making stuff available in terms of computing power, um, in terms of access to resources that are unthinkable. There, there probably isn't anything that you need that you can't have access to with a credit card. So I'm trying to encourage you to tell you that yes, entrepreneurship is for you the beginning of a journey. You still have to discover a lot of stuff, but feel comfortable. All the tools are on the road waiting for you. Um, they're all waiting for you. Your only challenge is putting a team together. And um, I think that um, I'm getting to an end of um, the thoughts that I have for this morning. So I don't know if I made it on time. My team is looking at me nodding that I think I made it on time. So it may be the time for questions. Um, I'm reading one question, uh, which is about the need for money to become an entrepreneur. Is that an important factor or not that much? Um, I love the end of that sentence. Is that an important factor or not that much? Um, you, you're going to get one of my favorite answers. It's yes and no. Uh, the answer is kind of it's important and it's not. You will find the solutions that you need when you look for them. And looking for money, you have to be there at the right time and at the right place with the right ask. Uh, so, so you have to do things like build what we call a financial model and you need that financial model to be credible. And at the same time, you need to be able to connect emotionally with the people that are going to be able to grant you that money. But you got to know one thing is the journey of money is forever with you. You always need more money for ever bigger projects and ever bigger ambitions. But the nice thing, as I told you, all along the road, the stuff is waiting for you. In Montreal, there's many programs starting from the very early days with organizations like PME that can make a few thousand dollars accessible to you. Then you invest that few thousand dollars into a, a, a MyTAC program, for example. You multiply that money by two. Um, and there's more programs like this. So, so yes, it's important. But at the same time, you look for it, you'll find it. I hope that answers that question. The next one is here. Um, the next question is, um, how likely is it that I actually launch a product after finishes the three phases of this course? I, I would say that, that um, the three phases of this course will allow you to start building and conceiving of a first product, what we'll call a, the, the terminology in the industry today is an MVP, the, the minimum viable product, you know, the, the ugly but minima that a client will start accepting and paying for that allows you to launch. Um, but, but I would say that you probably still will have a few months after this program needed of, of validation time and of, uh, of, of prototyping and testing before you have uh, a finished product. And, and I'm probably gonna end with a part of this answer that a lot of you technical people are not going to like. Um, I'm going to say, stop doing the technology, put it on hold, and start getting to know your eventual clients, your prospects, your, your, your prospective segments a lot better now before you invest in more in your product. Go get to know your client, get out of the building, go speak to them, be with them, share moments with them, come back and, and do design thinking. And oh, by the way, all you technical people, you're thinking design. That means somebody gave you a spec and you're gonna produce a, a, a drawing for product. That's not what design means in, in the world of entrepreneurship. Design means you're gonna start thinking the requirements of the client to eventually come up with a spec that you can do some engineering in, in with. So, so the, the design thinking here is get out of the building, go talk to people, um, and rely on those next three phases to learn how to do that. You, you trust me, you will, You'll be amazed how much you're going to find out. Um, we just did a program with 12 researchers in the pharmacology world um, over the last six months. Uh, I can send you some of their testimonials, but, but they changed as people just by going through the program. They, they say so themselves. Yeah. Jacopo, question. Do you believe in unicorn startup on your vision of startup is different? Oh, <laughs> Do I believe that I can go out and buy a lottery ticket and, uh, and, um, 
and win, yeah. Um, I do believe that I can buy a lottery ticket and win, but I don't think that's the point of our life every day. The point of our life every day is to have a, a goal, a dream, and, and to work at making it happen. And I think the startup vehicle is great for this. Um, but if you believe that maybe you'll be a unicorn, sure. But if that's what you get up in the morning for, maybe that's good. Um, but that's not the journey that I go down. The journey that I go down is how do I work with my team to get to the next the next goal and how do we build a, a vision in the two to three years coming that makes sense. I should keep my eyes open to becoming a unicorn if the opportunity shows up. And I'm not telling you not to be, but I'm telling you don't get up in the morning because you think you're going to be one tomorrow. I hope that answers your question. I have another question from Jacopo. Um, have you knowledge of the biotech market? Uh, to say that I have knowledge of the to say that I have knowledge of the biotech market would be probably too ambitious. Um, I, I've been starting to work in the last year with a lot of the life science. We recruited people. Um, Mazad, for example, who's, who's working with you guys on, on this program, comes from, from the bio and life science world. Um, our chief scientist uh, officer, Vince Martin of, of District 3, is, a, is, a, is definitely a recognized scientist, one of the most quoted people in, in bio and genomics a, a couple of years ago. Um, so, so, and we're opening up a life science hub um, in, um, in a year um, at, um, at Loyola, um, an entrepreneurship hub. Um, so, so definitely very open to it, but if you want an expert in bio, I'd have to bring you to Vince and, and some of the mentors that we've, uh, we've united and coaches we've united, like Edna, for example, who, who comes from that world. Sure, Edna will be here next week as well. Oh, and I'm being told that Edna will be a speaker for you, bio people and life science people next week. Yes. How one can distinguish between an idea that is way ahead of the market and one that is likely to fail? Hmm, uh, complex question. Um, I think there's two questions in that one question here. Um, the two questions in your question is, is um, being way ahead of the market versus one that is likely to fail. Failure has so many parameters, which I would say start with the fact that you don't have the right team or that you don't have the ability to animate the dynamics within your team. And there's different forms of dynamics, team dynamics. Uh, there's no you know, one way about this, but, but it's, an, it's kind of an art and, and, um, and it's a big challenge. And it's probably the single biggest transformation that I've seen the researchers need to go through for becoming scientific entrepreneurs. They, they need to understand two things that are really far out from your normal um, no, scope of thinking. One is uh, the team and the other one is sales. Those are probably the two single most challenging things you, you scientists usually have to, to overcome. Um, so that's to answer the likely to fail. It's not usually a product of technology issue. It's a dynamic issue. Um, and there's, there's 100 parameters in there. One of the most influential one is, is not the product, but it's the team. Um, and investors will also tell you sometimes they'd rather invest in a B product as long as there's an A team versus an A product in which there's a B team. Um, the second question that you asked, which is you're way ahead of the market. In all markets, there's what we call early adopters. These early adopters, the great thing about them is they will accept to pay for something that is an unfinished, ungood product. Your challenge is you're kind of looking for the treasure box, looking for the early adopter. Um, and that takes a lot of the research that you're going to be taught in this program, um, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb is get out of the building, go and meet a whole bunch of them. And then every meeting will open a new door. Every meeting will get you more people. Every meeting will get you more data. Sometimes that gets confusing because you're going to have too much data. Uh, and then this is where the team here is going to help you um, focus and, and structure on all this. I hope that answers your two questions. Zenith Qs asks, what do you think would be the what do you think would be the best way to start a business, give a full time to the business, do some part time while growing the business and see if it actually works? Um, it, it's kind of a, uh, that's a really good question. There, unfortunately, there's no magical answer except that it takes dedication and perseverance. And associated to dedication and perseverance usually means that your brain frame and your time available to do this. Of course, telling you to start tomorrow full-time without you having done any homework is probably not smart, 
So, so I think um, after this program where you're asked to, to spend a, a few hours a week, um, you would probably get to a phase where you would need to, need to spend 20, 25 hours a week per team member, and then after that, full time. So I would say uh, go through this program considering that the next phase will require 20, 25 hours, and, uh, and then that should last about 12 weeks again after this program. And then after that, you should be going full time. So, so everything else should be deducted from that example, you know, where are you going to get enough salary so that you can afford to, you know, eat pizzas and cheap coffee for, for a year or two or so. The, the overall journey, what we call the, where you should draw your line in the sand is about a two year journey for most people. At the end of two years, you should really ask yourself the hard question. Do I keep going? Is this working or is it not working for me? Um, but it takes as long as, you know, it can take as little as three months to step out because you will have encountered enough things to tell you out. Um, but before you really confirm full speed growth uh, and team building and enterprise building, it can take as long as two years. I hope that answers your question, Zenith. And I have a question from Orkun. If you were in your early 20s again, what would you be looking for new, where would you be looking for new projects? Wow, <laughs> there is so many exploding technologies right now that I wouldn't, my challenge would be, there's so many exploding technologies right now um, that some people classify them as exponential technologies, um, biogenomics, uh, so, some of the nanotechnologies and, and even molecular tech, um, artificial intelligence, um, a lot more stuff is coming out. This neural network is, stuff is already out of date. Um, I think that, that you're going to see more technologies that what you know what to do with, and a lot of those can bring value to market. Um, so I, I think I would, personally, I love systems. I love you know, artificial intelligence-like concepts. Um, I, I love software. Um, so I probably go there. If I had to choose another field, I'd be really interested in bio and genomics um, because you can bridge the two worlds. Um, but this is so personal that there's there's an, there's almost like an infinite amount of permutations and combinations right now in the tech exploding world. Um, so sorry, I couldn't give you a more specific answer. Um, Tony, what is one of your best moments as an entrepreneur? What is something that you're proud of? Oh, it's, it's just proud. I think there isn't one best moment. There's like a thousand, a million best moments. It's a journey full of great moments. Um, that's the simplest way I can answer. Um, proud of is I'm always proud of teams. The proudest thing I'm, I'm of, uh, wrong English. What makes me the most proud is, is being able to create teams that, that just get shit done and, and change things around them. So that's my, um, sort of passion but um yeah the journey is a million great moments uh next question ali ali is asking me a very long question i'm gonna try to read it sharing my idea always scares me a little i feel that someone might steal my idea and get ahead of me feels design thinking is completely the opposite oh you know Ali, there's something that's going to be really hard for you to probably understand as I'm answering your question. There is a million ideas a day generated. Humanity, you know, which is already a lot of people, think that each person has an idea a day. Uh, and, okay, maybe reduce that to a couple of ideas to those people that are well off enough that they can have ideas. You're still looking at planet-wide a lot of ideas. And I'm sure that as you're having your ideas, someone on the planet is having the same idea. When we did the microprocessor-based flight simulator, we discovered that there was another two other teams in the world that were doing the same thing. In theory, we were the only ones, okay? So this was 30 years ago. I don't think things have changed. It's not about ideas. It's about who carries them and materializes and generates impact. Idea to impact is the challenge. It's not the idea. Um, so yeah, um, a lot of people will tell you, you know, design thinking is too open of a dialogue. I, I would say they're wrong. The design thinking is actually the way to think. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be proprietary about certain things that you want to patent. Um, and, and those you have to 
keep close to your chest. But that has nothing to do with ideas. Uh, and you should know more about patents and go to, to uh, work sessions on patents to understand the specificities of that. But certainly not asking questions, not getting out of the building is how you're going to kill yourself. You're, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, so think of it like you got no choice. Get over that fear and, and you know, think that you're going to move faster than other people because you're dedicated and you have the expertise needed to materialize that idea. It's all about materializing the impact. So as you can tell, I'm passionate about this subject. Um, next question. Anna, uh, yes, yes, I am planning on developing a service business, not a product. Can this workshop help? Yes, of course. Um, this workshop applies for products or services. Um, it's true that uh, you're going to need to deal with, uh, with uh, different types of mentors, different types of interviews, but, but uh, design a service or design a product has each their specificity. But at this level, I don't think there's, um, there's, there needs to be a different types of program for services or, or products. Um, but good question, but don't worry about it at this level. Um, during your first year, you jump into the startup world or remain connected to your project with a side job. Um, again, it depends how much money you have. I would say the, the later you spend your money, the longer you can keep your money and the longer you can keep making money, the better off you are. So the rule of thumb should be that um, I get connected to the project as long as I have money. If it's not hampering me from doing my project, why should I not do this job? But you will need what we call a, enough money to create a runway for yourself, meaning you've bought enough time ahead of you to get to the next phase. Um, so it's a case by case decision. Um, and and uh, I remember when we built Mectronics, Mectronics wouldn't have survived if we hadn't found a whole bunch of side jobs to continue paying the bills. Um, but that also extended our, our it, it extended as a long term. It also then made us take twice as long to deliver our projects in the market. And the market in these days is much more competitive and fast moving than it's ever been and it will continue to go faster. So I suggest the fast, your decision should be, what's the fastest way to get the market that you can uh, do with the cash that you have? And then, and then he's asking second question, I offer a service, I'm very afraid of someone stealing my idea, it's been done to me before, what would be your advice? Um, the advice about someone stealing, I think I spoke about that earlier, um, it's, it's about who gets stuff done. Uh, protecting your ideas can be done with patents. The patents have their limits, and it's only for those people that can afford to defend their patents that the patents are worth something. So be careful. Uh, that being said, investors love patents. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons why patents are very good. Um, and I think one of the uh, moments you'll have in this, in this program will be to find out a bit more about patents. And if not, we'll be able, we can guide you at District 3 to, uh, to different places on, on patents. But the fact that on one side you need to protect yourself, yes, but don't let that stop you from having to go to market, getting out of the building. And remember, when you're talking to people, you're talking to them about their problems. You're talking to them about eventual value propositions you're going to do, potentially feature sets. But you don't have to talk to them about how you're going to do it. And usually your patent is about how you're going to do stuff. Um, so, so there is a lot of conversation that can be had before you get into one that, that hampers your, your patent process. But again, get advice from patent people uh, needed. Neil is asking the question, do you Neil is asking the question, do you think launching a company is a full-time job or can be done besides a, a routine full-time one? No, you cannot do a full-time job and, and really launch a company. You can do the early phases of the journey um, as a part-time job, as I was explaining earlier with, you know, at the beginning, uh, 10 hours a week. If, if you do less than eight hours a week, you're, you're not really moving forward. So, and it doesn't have to be you, but if you or someone else combined, don't do eight to 10 hours a week, things are not gonna go anywhere. Um, you very quickly need to move up to 20 hours a week per member and, and eventually uh, full time. 
but but definitely if you have a full time job eight to five and uh, and you're trying to do this entrepreneurship, it'll work for a little while. But but I think by the end of this program, you're going to need to move up to 20 and then very quickly within a, a few months to go full time. So as soon as possible, try to figure out how you're going to finance this and get a long enough runway for you to take off. Jacob, do you think that we need to plan our ideas alone or not? I'm not so sure. So do you think that we need to plan our ideas alone or not? I'm not so sure I understand the, um, the question about patenting alone. Um, patents usually involve several people. There's, um, and there's a definition of these different roles that the patent lawyers can give you. Um, you could do it alone if the idea came to you by yourself, um, but you have to recognize inventors from owners of patents. So, um, so I think that's more a question for patent people than for me. Uh, Celso Guven, I'm sure I didn't pronounce your name right. How to choose the right, how to choose the right co-founder for your startup? Wow, um, that that is definitely a a good question. It's a bit like saying, how do you choose the right person to get married to? Um, part of it is um, uh, part of it is purely emotional, uh, of a feeling that it fits. Part of it is is technical. Are you guys compatible? Uh, technically, do you have too much overlap or do you uh, contribute what each other is missing? Um, think of it that, you know, to the two of you, you should have a, over 50% of, of the knowledge needed to get to where you go. Uh, so don't tell me you're going to do a, a software if you don't have as a co-founder or software developer that can do a full stack um, or at least understand the full stack. So so it's a... Uh, um, it's a um, it's a case by case. Um, the, the first thing is, do you like to get up in the morning and go for work, go for coffee, go to Starbucks and be with that person? The second one is, are they contributing in a complimentary way? You know, and the third one, are they as dedicated as you are? Will they go through um, the goods and the bads? And, and I think one of the things that you can do is meet some of the entrepreneurs we have here who have co-founders with them, and then they can tell you, um, you know, there's a lot of people that you can interview on this. There's a similar question at the bottom. Um, I'm going to jump to Rodrigo's question because it's similar. Charlie tells me, what is the best way to meet like-minded potential entrepreneurs to share brainstorming ideas in order to find the right people to start a project? Does District 3 provide environments like this to match uh, starters, entrepreneurs? So, Yes, there is all sorts of different events. So what's really cool in Montreal right now um, is that there's many events where you can meet people. Um, it's kind of like, you know, dating platforms. Um, there is Montreal New Tech, for example, which organizes a lot of events. There isn't a single domain in Montreal that doesn't have a, a community, uh, formal or informal, around it. Um, for example, um, Mazad here is created in Montreal uh, around District 3, a, a, a bio life science community and, and a bio life science AI specifically community. So, um, but, it, but if you look for those communities, you need to go to events where you share a moment with people because what's the best way to get to know someone and, and eventually build um, them to the next step is share a moment with them. Some of those are standard like hackathons. Um, hackathons are good places to go meet people because the, the, the product or the idea handled at the hackathon may or may not work, but you will have met cool people. Uh, so, so go and Google events around subjects of interest that you have and, uh, and go to those events and eventually you will meet someone. Um, if you're into FinTech, we have a FinTech space. If you're into social, we have a social space. We work with form FinTech, for example, and, and it's a combination of people who like, uh, the, the finance world and who like tech and, and um, making stuff happen over there. So again, I could go on for hours on this, but, but yeah, this, District 3 does have, and the whole Montreal ecosystem is very rich in places where you can go meet people. Um, next question from Ali. Could you comment on the importance of mentors and who should they be, how to approach them? Oops, um, I think I'm, I'm still on speaker. I closed off it's Ali's okay, yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah. So, so Ali, um, your, your question is a good one. 
um, um, you need, first I'm going to say that, that there's three different roles that, that you can have um, that people sort of often confuse around the one word mentor. Uh, one is experts, uh, experts in financing, experts in product management, experts in technologies of any kind. Um, and an expert is not a mentor. Um, and I'll get to the explanation of mentor more specifically in a minute, but an expert is a very valuable person and you may need an expert that continues to, to help you in, in your journey. And, and that can be a professor that you've been with. It could be um, someone that you've known for a long time, um, someone that you reach out through a network. The second role, which is different from mentor as well, is coaching. Someone who's going to be with you. If you've ever played a team sport or any sport with a coach, uh, you know that that coach can't be playing the game with you, but they're on the sideline and they're hard on you and they're making sure that you get to the next level. Um, and they do that within a very restrained time frame because there's games to win. So, so the coach is an important role. And then the mentor is also an important role. The mentor is a person that's going to get to know you. They're going to get to understand your vision over the long term. They're not going to expect short-term results. They're going to be helping you with their business cards and their connections with their 30 years of experience. Um, which a way answers to you, what do you need as a mentor? Mentor is someone that has got 20 years under their belt um, that have uh, or more and that have a network that is mentally available to, to spend time with you that will believe you as a person. There is also another form of network, which is advisory committees, which is um, the step just before you get to a board. Uh, we've created a program called Mentor Connect. Uh, once your company gets to a set level of maturity, these advisors can be very powerful, especially when you unite. The way we do it is we unite three mentors in one advisory council like platform. Um, so, so it can get quite sophisticated. But hopefully I've, under, I've answered your, your question and, and I've added a bit to it. Uh, one more question. I have two more questions to answer. The, the, the question marathon is almost over, guys. Um, answer live on Jacopo. What is the better way to study your market? Ooh, uh, the better way to study your market is get out of your building and go to that market. So, so for example, if you want to study the market of banks, get to know bankers, go visit them, spend time with them, convince them that they need to spend 20 minutes with you, which will stretch into 40 minutes and and get them to tell you about their lives, their needs, and their expertise. Um, if you want to do, I don't know, building structures, and you've got this great civil engineering solution, um, and that it's for something that is only good when um, it's a country with a lot of ice, well, then there's no need to go to the tropics. Uh, go to the North Pole, go to Iceland, go to Norway, go to you know um, wherever it is it snows a lot, and go meet people that are building infrastructures. So again, that means that you may travel. Um, the world, I, I do want you to realize something. I will advise you to get your early adopters as closely geographically to where you live as possible because of the convenience of things. But I will also advise you ASAP to get out of the building, to get out of the city, to get out of the province, to get out of the country um, and, uh, and, and go find out where your real markets are. Uh, you need to think global, worldwide, international, ASAP. And last question from Rajam. Um, I have too much ideas, same as any PhD students, but always happen to find myself in a blind alley, nowhere to turn. I'm stuck. Do I build something when I don't know what to build? My question about psychological techniques could be help to get unstuck. I don't think it's a psychological technique, the answer. There is actually a method called um, the, the business model validation, uh, which is uh, the use of a business model canvas. And a lot of people think business model canvas, oh, I'm going to read about it and I'm going to open the book and, and I'm going to answer a oh, business model canvas is nine questions on one page. So, you know, how complicated can that be? That's the easy part. The, the much more complicated part is how do you use that as basis of, of, of data collection for a hypothesis that you then validate. And then once you get the data, you iterate around that hypothesis, okay? So, so that's a bit scientific, what I just said. It's, it's, a, it's the core principles behind research, hypotheses, data, 
uh, validation and, uh, and iterate. That loop is what you need to do. You need to start with an idea. It doesn't really matter which one you pick at the beginning. Well, when I say it doesn't matter, uh, you know, all within context, um, but you need to pick one and you need to get going about that first hypothesis and you will very quickly generate other hypotheses which will lead you to more out of the building meetings to get more data uh, and eventually you'll focus on the one that's more accessible and easier for you to scale. So, so all that to say is that um, there is a method to the madness. I don't think it's a psychological issue. I don't know you, so I don't know if you don't have a psychological issue. Um, that's, that's all meant to be with humor, but, but what I can say is that those, those tools and those methods do work. That's what we used. We've used them 500 times, literally with 500 startups here at District 3. And, um, and when it doesn't work, it's not the method the problem. Then it might be a bit of a psychological issue. But I would say that's less than 10% of the people. So um, I think you need to be open-minded, get out of the building. You know, you guys as researchers and scientists, your biggest challenge right now is to transform yourselves into business people. And, and transforming yourself into business people is the... Uh, um, um, it takes, I wish it could be done in a week. It's not. It, it's a journey of personal transformation that can take a few months, can be as little as a few months. I've seen it. Um, for some, some of the most technically competent, it actually takes them longer. So it's kind of like an inverse relationship with how deep and technically competent you are and how long it's going to take you to convert to business and sales. Um, and so the best way to do that is team up with the right person. Um, hopefully I've answered your question. And, um, and that you're now unstuck and can get going.